All right, uh, let's start. Um, it's a great pleasure to have a uh, such step from Harvard. He's a guru uh, in the condensed matter uh, physics community, and he has been working on uh, condensed matter theories and also the connection between uh, condensed matter theories and chip theory. But today he'll talk about uh, his theory of uh, high thesis conduct. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sona. It's uh, great to be here on this beautiful day in Virginia. Um, so uh, let me just begin by first uh, mentioning various collaborators. Uh, actually, these are students and postdocs uh, in my group at Harvard. Uh, Max is now at Santa Barbara. The yes. uh, There we go. <laughs> <laughs> David Sow is uh, at Maryland, and the rest are still at Harvard. Uh, okay, and uh, I'm going to be presenting also a, a fair amount of experimental results, uh, some of them in collaboration with the group of uh, Jenny Hoffman at, at Harvard, uh, but the main part, uh, the main new result I want to talk about today is, uh, is in the group of uh, Seamus Davis at Cornell. Okay. So I imagine you've had many talks on high temperature superconductors, but uh, it will be useful to have a summary of the basic problem. It's, a, it's an old field going back. 20 plus years uh, with many uh, in beautiful ideas, many failed ideas, many <laughs> experiments, many wrong experiments, many right experiments, and it all gets very confusing even for people who are in the field. So I, I'm going to try to simplify things and focus on just a couple of basic points uh, because I think those are the most important ones uh, and really uh, hopefully convince you that. Uh, and towards the end, I'll run through many slides about more complicated extensions. Uh, for the experts if you want to know about the full field. Anyway, so we are interested in materials like this. Uh, so they look rather complicated, but the most important excitations uh, lie on a single plane of copper and oxygen. So if I draw that plane here, I'm just going to focus mostly, essentially for every slide in my talk, on the dynamics of uh, the electrons in this plane. So the copper atoms have one orbital here, and the oxygen atom has one orbital there. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're interested in following the uh, properties of this particular structure as you vary the density of electrons uh, on this plane. And, and, and the other, and the rest of the crystal is just a clever way of making that happen. Okay, so we just focus on this plane. So if you now look at the function of density, uh, this is one version of a phase diagram of a recent work uh, of a YBCO. Uh, which uh, summarizes the basic points I want to focus on in this talk. So first of all, uh, at when you have very low hole density, meaning exactly one electron for each copper, uh, then you have an antiferromagnet where the uh, copper, the, that electron on the <coughs> copper forms this checkerboard type pattern. And so everybody agrees with that. And this uh, in YBCO lasts only for a small range of doping and for the most part will not play any role, direct role, in what I'm going to talk about. Then, of course, uh, if you go to very high doping, uh, <coughs> then you have a good metal. So the kind of metal you'd learn about in solid state 101, where you just take three electrons moving on this lattice and have them occupy the lowest energy states. Uh, then the boundary of the occupied states gives you the Fermi surface, uh, and the area enclosed by the Fermi surface is equal to the density of electrons. So all those classic theorems of solid state physics work perfectly, uh, provided the hole density is large enough. And this is a photo emission measurement of the Fermi surface. Uh, and really, everything works. So I don't need to say anything more about, uh, about uh, this particular state, because it's, uh, it's a nice metal, just like copper, gold, silver, and, and our theories work beautifully. OK, so then what, what are the interesting regimes? The interesting things are in between the good metal and the antiferromagnet. Uh, there is a strange metal here at higher temperatures, which I will not say anything about in this talk, but I'm happy to say much more if you want to talk about it. <coughs> uh, so I'm going to focus on the superconductor and this mysterious red region here. What is this? So this, this phase diagram was first drawn by uh, Mark Julian and his group through NMR, and, and this particular line is, has to do with certain uh, splittings in the NMR lines at finite temperature. I, again, I don't want to spare you the details. <coughs> Let me just say that it seems like there's some other quantum state appearing here, and the purpose of my presentation 
is to replace that question mark with an answer. Okay. Then one other caveat that I should present for the experts is that there is a lot of work on mysterious states in this range of whole density, uh, and most and much of that work, with, with a lot of progress, is based on these lanthanum-based superconductors. So they, they are somewhat different, perhaps not totally different, but they're somewhat different. They have lower TCs, uh, and they are different in particular in that the green and the red regions overlap with each other. And that, in some, as I'm going to argue, that makes them a little more complicated, in fact. And it's better to focus on all the other superconductors where I can forget about the spin order. And that's what I'm going to do. So <coughs> if you know a lot about the important work of Tranquara and some of the other people mentioned there, uh, that's certainly important, but it's on a different series of compounds mostly. Okay. And have our focus on YBC, Obisco, and really all the others, the ones with the highest TCs, where this red region really seems to be well separated from the region of spin order. All right, so those are all the co caveats. That's the introduction, and the question I want to answer is what is going on there? Uh, so this is the outline. I'll begin, first of all, just by reviewing the superconductor. Why, you know, also let's go back. So, uh, so what's special about these superconductors, of course, TC is very high. Uh, and, you know, do we know why TC is very high? Well, I think most people agree you have some idea. It has to do with the anti magnetism and the coupling between the electrons. Uh, but it's also become clear from many, many works that to really understand that, we also have to nail down what's going on here. And that's why we're so fascinated by this problem. Uh, okay. You should, are you going to tell us what distinguishes the red region from the... Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The All right. Okay, so good. let's now begin very simply. Let's talk about the superconductor. So I'll just review a few basic facts and apologies to the experts. Uh, so what is a superconductor? A superconductor in two lines is a Bose condensate of pairs of electrons. So you take a pair of electrons, uh, in this case with opposite spin, so this pair now condenses, means it has some average value. But what we've learned over many years of studying superconductors, it's useful to think of the pair of electrons at two different points in space. And then you can write uh, the, uh, this expectation value in terms of two factors. There's one factor which depends on the average coordinate of the pair, which we think of as the order parameter. That's the condensate wave function which is basically one <coughs> in the perfect superconductor, but if you perturb it due to the boundaries <coughs> or magnetic fields, it might vary slowly a little bit. So for my talk, that's going to be one. Uh, so what, what we are often interested in is, the, is this so-called pair wave function, which depends on the internal coordinates, the relative coordinates of the two electrons. What are they doing relatively to each other while the pair is basically both condensing? So what we know is that that internal wave function has a D-symmetry. So that's a highly non-trivial fact, uh, really the, uh, which is universally true in all of the copper-based superconductors, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it tells us something about the, uh, the origin of superconductivity. All the old previous superconductors, the VCS, the low TC superconductors, uh, had an S wave function here. So how do we know this? Well, to, to figure this out requires a subtle quantum interference <coughs> experiment. Uh, and the classic experiment was done uh, by <coughs> Sui and Kirtley. Um, and basically what they do is they take uh, a substrate of strong chip titanate with the uh, crystal axes oriented in very clever ways. And on top of the substrate, they grow rings of YBCO. So these are four rings shown here. Uh, and, and they're arranged so that the substrate that lines up the lattice, the copper oxygen lattice, uh, and so this D-wave pair has different orientations in each of these crystal, crystalline regions. And so when you have a ring, say a ring that intersect, uh, well, I don't know, this ring here intersects this boundary, this ring is just sitting out here, for example, uh, you can just see that there's no net phase shift as you go around the ring, and so when you measure the magnetic field, which is what, this is a squid measurement of the magnetic field, you don't see any flux. But if you put a ring right in the center, you see a flux, and, and that, as they showed very beautifully, is evidence that uh, there's this D-wave pair wave function. You see a flux of exactly half a flux quantum there, corresponding to the sign change of the wave function. 
All right, so this is a long time ago, and many, since then, many experiments have verified this in many different ways. And this is a, one of the few properties of the superconductor that everybody now agrees about. All right, so what about the red region? So this is what I want to focus on now, uh, this question mark, and say a little bit about uh, what we know about it. Now, of course, again, there's been uh, 10 years of work at least with thousands of experiments, literally, and I, I am going to give you my biased history of the important experiments, but okay. Uh, so I would say that the first indication of what was going on here uh, came in uh, STM experiments, and I'm going to show you STM and X-ray scattering experiments. Uh, came in XTM experiments uh, where they put a magnetic field and they measured a vortex lattice. So these are, now what's happening is that these Cooper pairs of electrons are spinning around in these vortices. <coughs> but when they look more carefully at the centers of the vortices, uh, what they saw was a modulation in the density of states, and presumably also in the charge density, <coughs> with a period of four lattice spacings. Uh, and this was a region, you know, substantial region of 100 angstroms, where the vortex core is only about 10 angstroms, uh, around each vortex core. Okay, so this was some indication that there's some kind of charge density wave uh, may be present, uh, at least when you put a magnetic field and you get a look at the core of vortices. Uh, since then, these kind of experiments have come a long way. This is 2002. Uh, people have now very carefully designed much more sensitive STM experiments. Uh, and here's now the kind of pictures you can see. Uh, this is actually from 2007 uh, at zero magnetic field. So again, I'm, I, would, I would spend another 10 minutes explaining or even more what exactly is being done. But let's just say they come up with a clever way of being very sensitive to local density of states. <coughs> uh, and they best measure how the density of states varies as you go from point to point on the lattice. And when you do this, you see this thing, uh, which is independent, this pattern that's independent of the voltage at which you're seeing the, the substrate, which is important. And, and it looks like a mess, okay. Well, I mean, the, in fact, you can make out uh, the copper, uh, the copper, copper spacing is roughly the width of that green dot. So they've really got very high resolution pictures of the surface of this copper oxygen plane. Somehow they can get sub, -resol sub angstrom resolution of, of some density on the copper oxygen plane. So this is below TC? Yes, this is low temperature. So if you go above TC, you don't see Well, it. no, you do see it, but again, let me simplify it to this one experiment. <laughs> uh, you, I mean, it becomes more disordered and so on, but uh, you do see this above TC. Uh, Yazdani <coughs> and others have done that. Okay. Uh, so now, the first thing you could do, so I'm going to call this actually my cosmic background map. It's a picture <laughs> of something, uh, of a superconductor, and uh, some intensity variations. So what do you do? Well, you take a Fourier transform, which is what the cosmic background map people did. Uh, so when you take a Fourier transform, I, I'll show you those Fourier transforms later for a good reason. You kind of see not very well defined, but reasonably well defined peaks. Uh, in the Fourier transform at 2 pi times 1 quarter, which means that there's a charge density wave of four lattice spacings, which is consistent with this four lattice spacing you saw over here. So it seems like the same pattern, but now extending over much <coughs> larger regions. Okay, excuse me. Yeah. So it looks like there are stripes yes. going. So is, is it that period? Uh, it well, first of all, I should say this is the x and y direction. Okay. So these things. This has to do with surface reconstruction. And, uh, well, it's, so it's something else. It's something else, and it disappears. It doesn't have, um, affect anything to the Fourier transform. It's a much longer wavelength thing. So once you take a Fourier transform, that's all filtered out. Okay. Uh, but what I'm going to argue, and maybe it's already clear just by looking at this picture, there seems to be much more to this map than just its Fourier transform. Uh, and as you'll see, just as for the cosmic background, you had to do a polarization analysis to get the new information you heard about. Uh, there's something similar here. <laughs> <laughs> At least had the same spirit. All right, so that's a few years ago uh, where people, you know, there was this indication of some sort of charge density wave appearing in the superconductor at low doping. Uh, so that's where it stood. 
Uh, and historically, as I'll say a little bit later, there were these quantum oscillation measurements, which again gave impetus for people to realize that it probably is a charge density wave. And it wasn't until actually last year, two years ago actually, <coughs> that X-ray scattering also saw a peak uh, at the same wave vector. Of, and this is a different compound, but roughly three to four lattice spacings. This is in reciprocal space. You see a very defined peak corresponding to some sort of charge density wave. Now, you know, so this came about from improvements in X-ray scattering and careful detection. Uh, it's actually quite a strong signal and uh, you know, it could have in principle been seen a long time ago, but uh, now, I know there's at least three different groups that see this charge density wave uh, with uh, period four lattice spacing uh, and their consistency check between STM and X-ray all seem to roughly agree. Uh, well, yeah, so there is, that's right, it has a non-monotonic temperature dependence, uh, and we have a paper about that, uh, but again, I, for want of time, I won't, don't want to discuss that. Let me just focus on the low temperature behavior. So that has to do with the competition between the two order parameters, why it becomes stronger above TC than below TC. Okay, so let's just focus on the structure of the charge density wave. Uh, and so what is a charge density wave? Well, it's just a modulation of the electron density. So let me write it suggestively in this manner. It has some oscillation at wave vector Q, uh, and so that defines Q. And then the coefficient is my condensate. Let me just think of it as some kind of order parameter, which is practically one. But now what I want to do is make an analogy to my first discussion of Cooper pairing, where I thought of superconductivity as a condensate of pairs of electrons. So if I look at this, this looks like a condensate of an electron and a hole. But it happens to be you're taking the two at the same point in space. <coughs> so why not let them be at different points in space? So I just generalize that, whoops, okay, to having these two at different points in space. So now I'm thinking of some more generalized charge density wave, which I'm thinking of as a condensate of particle hole pairs, not particle particle pairs. This is another way to talk about it. But now there's a little more structure. There's the average coordinate, which determines the order parameter, which is constant, and the oscillation, which determines the wave vector, which depends on the average coordinate. And this is actually really key to write it this way. But then there's also this very interesting possible factor uh, which is the pair particle hole wave function, yeah. the internal wave function of the charge density wave. So this is the kind of thing that we haven't seen much discussion of at all, really, or even detection of in any any material. This pair wave function uh, of the particle hole pair, the internal wave function. So here, let me just I'm going to describe it in terms of uh, a Fourier transform P of k, and if you write things this way. And then assuming this time reversal symmetry, then this function should be an even function. Uh, and so you just write, you can expand this even function in the following way. Uh, there's a constant which you call the S component. This thing that has this full symmetry of the lattice but with its cosines, we call that the S prime component. And then there's this one, we call the D component because it looks like X squared minus Y squared. And we'll just stop there. So in principle, if you're given a charge density wave, you can measure these, these quantities. Okay. Now, why am I doing this? Well, uh, so as I'll get to in the second part of my talk, in some theories that I've been working in for the last four or five years, uh, particular work uh, starting <coughs> work by Max Miklitsky, my former student, uh, it turns out in a certain class of theories, and it's not important right now what class and why, but I'll come to that later, uh, we had reason for believing that actually this D component is the one that's going to be really large. That there is a charge density wave, but it's a charge density wave which is mostly in the D. <coughs> so the fact that this is D and the superconductivity is D will, in the end, will have some microscopic connections. But in terms of experiment, these are two very different statements, have very different physical consequences. I showed you the physical consequences of the D wave Cooper pairing that comes in, in this tricrystal experiment with the flux and so on. You have to do a very subtle interference experiment. Here, as here the D, as we'll see, has a much more direct consequence uh, for just this generalized charge density wave operator, which you can measure quite easily. 
So let me just show you a picture of what, uh, well, so here's another picture of it, uh, where this part is, has this destructor locally, and then this part oscillates. Uh, and for the gravitational people, that's sort of like a gravity wave. It's a photopolar wave, which uh, changes sign as you go along. But, but what does it look like on the lattice? Well, this is what it looks like. So here I've just taken a simple example uh, where I've taken this function P of K to be just the purely D function. And I've taken some commensurate wave vector. Again, that's not important. And what I've drawn is the value of this Pij, this off-site expectation value, uh, for every bond, for every nearest neighbor of copper sign. So what is this quantity? Well, you can think of this as just the charge density in the oxygen, or the kinetic energy, what's the, prop what's the amplitude for an electron to be tunneling back and forth between two sides? It's just a, a scalar quantity defined on the bonds. So you just take this, this Fourier, just take this expression, put it into Mathematica, and, and draw, you get this color plot. So what you see is that is some density. So think of the colors here as the density on the oxygen sides, which are sitting between the copper sides, which are the circles. Uh, and what you see on the vertical bonds is the density wave with period four lattice spacings. You look at the horizontal bond, you see a density wave with period four lattice spacing. But the two density waves have a phase shift of exactly pi. Uh, because when this is red, that's blue, and vice versa. Or you can see the quadrupolar here. Here's the D wave, red, you know blue, red, blue, red, and then red, blue, red, blue. So that, that's half a period, the, the D wave changes sign. Okay. <coughs> now, if I just took the Fourier transform of this, we did X-ray scattering on this unpolarized X-ray scattering or STM, measured everything, uh, the Fourier transform would be zero. And that's because uh, the horizontal density wave and the vertical density wave have a phase shift of pi and they'll cancel each other. And, and in fact, that's the reason we believe now that the signals were so weak in the initial experiments. <laughs> all right, so that's my claim then, that uh, in these STM and all of these experiments, uh, the density wave that they're seeing uh, is of this form. It's a, D, it's a D form factor for a charge density wave. And it's only on oxygen? It can have much smaller component than copper, but it's predominantly on the oxygen. All right, so how are we going to, okay, let me skip that. So this is what we want to establish. So now let me go back, and I'll, this is the analysis I proposed to, to Seamus' group just a couple of months ago. So here's this picture that's been sitting around, and we said there's a charge density wave, but it looks like a big mess. We take the Fourier transform, it doesn't really look like it. The peak is there, but it's kind of iffy. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to double it, just the same picture twice. And then we're going to mask the picture. We're going to take the left-hand side and only look at the signal on the oxygen. These are the oxygen sites. This is greatly grown up, uh, which are on the Y bonds. And here I look at the oxygen sites on the X bonds. Okay? And the pictures look similar, but they're not identical now, not anymore. On one side, you're just looking at, uh, if I go back here, uh, you're looking at the horizontal bonds only on the other side you look at the vertical bonds only. Right? <coughs> now I take the Fourier transform of I, I select it and I take the Fourier transform of both pictures. Uh, this is what you get. Now this is Q space. Uh, and now you see here so this is the X directed oxygen bonds, the real and imaginary part. Uh, and these are the X and Y axes. And you see these four peaks here. Uh, that's at one quarter zero. So that's the charge density wave peak. Uh, this same picture is over here, uh, and the circles are those peaks there. Okay, not, not terribly, you know, it, there is a peak. There's definitely something at that wave vector, and it doesn't disperse with anything. Uh, and this is the same, and if you look at the y directed bonds, it uh, looks roughly similar. Okay, so there, so there is a charge density wave. Uh, on both the X oxygens and the Y oxygen at the same period. Now what I'm going to do is something very simple. I'm going to take this, this is phase sensitive information, I'm going to take this thing and add it to this. Just add these two. So just look here, so I'm going to take the real part of OX and add real part of OY. So that's, so this is OX plus OY. And you see that, now you look at it again, 
Uh, most of the sample, you know, just become, looks roughly similar, but right in the circles, the signal completely disappears. <laughs> right there. Uh, so that's evidence that this is the opposite sign of that in this region. You do the same thing for the imaginary part, and again, you see the peaks, four peaks here, and they're gone. Uh, let me show you that. So that's that's the main result. <laughs> and uh, okay. Uh, something that I'm still very excited about. Uh, let me show it to you another way. Uh, let's take, you know, the signal at every one of these pixels. So you get a signal for OX. You get a complex number for OX <coughs> at every pixel. You get a complex number for OY at every pixel. So here's a kind of a scatter plot of those complex numbers. You pick a pixel. You measure OX. That gives you this complex number. Then at the same pixel, you measure OY. It's right there. So it has the, roughly the opposite magnitude and a phase shift of pi. Pick another pixel, there it is. Again, equal and opposite. Any other. So it's basically almost 100% anti-correlation. There's a D wave hiding in there in that complicated mess. Uh, there's this D form factor charge density wave. Now, another thing you can do is you can take all the pixels and do a scatter plot uh, of the difference in the amplitudes and the phase difference for every pixel uh, in that circle, in that, in that region. If you did it anywhere else, you would, it wouldn't look like this at all. But if you look right in that region, uh, you see that it's basically a perfect uh, phase sensitive measurement of pi. So there is a pi phase shift between the density wave on the oxygen sites, on the X bonds, and the Y bonds. So that's the, the, the main punchline in a way, at least the experimental punchline, uh, that this is a charge density wave, and, <coughs> and really it's the, I'm not aware of any other charge density wave previously having this kind of form, this non-trivial form factor. So just like the D form factor, the Cooper pair, was, was the first for the cuprates, uh, at least first conclusively established, uh, here they also have the D form factor in the charge density wave. And uh, this really establishes that without with very little doubt. Uh, let me again convince you pictorially. Uh, let me just take the same picture but focus on a tiny region like that. Okay. And I take that region and blow it up and rotate it by 45 degrees. So this is the raw data uh, of, if you wish, the density uh, on every pixel. And the plus signs are where the copper sites are and uh, the oxygen that between the coppers on the horizontal and vertical bonds. So let me draw my picture earlier. This is the picture I drew, but now it's exactly the same scale. And uh, depending upon your imagination, those pictures, to me, those pictures now look completely identical. Uh, but let me help you along. Uh, let me take every blue line here and, and draw a black line across it. Okay, and now look at the two pictures. I mean, they're just bang on, really. <laughs> uh, and what I've shown you before was just an unbiased Fourier transform way of showing the phase shift of pi between the horizontal and vertical bonds. So, so this is then the order parameter <coughs> of the cube rates. Uh, I guess that's the bottom line. That's my claim. Uh, at least the non lanthanum based cube rates. And there are similar measurements in several other cube rates already and they're all consistent with this. Uh, here's another picture of it. Where I've actually drawn the orbitals, and now and you can again see the similarities between, because I've used the same color scheme now, and uh, it has essentially the same pattern. Of course, the real pattern, the full pattern, you know, is a, mess, is a mess, but really I didn't choose that very carefully. You can, you can make other, uh, other choices, and you'll see roughly the same. And of course, the Fourier transform of the whole thing just does it without any, <laughs> without any bias. It's telling you very, you know, almost with a, a perfect uh, fidelity that there's a phase shift of pi in the two density waves. May I ask you? So yes. this picture is not just intensity, because no, it's something called the R map. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you you are able to do interference, destructive interference. Of, uh, no, 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 no. Oh, sorry. So this picture is intensity. Absolutely. This in is just intensity. intensity. But when you take a Fourier transform, you have phase information. So it's better, yeah, it's like, if, 
STM gives you real space information. This is yeah, the real space information. The Fourier transform has phase information. If you did, if you, you know, if you had two beams of light scattering off, if you made a hologram with scattering, then you could reconstruct the phase information. But STM, you know, you already have the data in real space, so there's no problem. You have the phase information. But what's being measured is the it's the Fourier transform of an intensity, okay? Uh, and that intensity modulates, but you know the phase of the wave of the intensity. <coughs> so it's not, it's, so that's why it's, in that sense it's very different from the Cooper pair, where there you had a, phase, a real phase which was gauge dependent and required a quantum interference measurement. This is not a quantum interference measurement. It's just a density measurement, intensity measurement, <coughs> But it's a very careful Fourier, phase sensitive Fourier transform of an intensity measurement. That's what it takes to pull out this D wave. Yeah? Do they, do they observe that it going away as you check yes. the temperature? Yes. So at, at TC or elsewhere? Several papers will be coming out on all of these things. Yeah, this, is, you know, this is literally two weeks old. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all of that so being done. Yeah. Okay, but it's at yes, TC the answer is yes. It's certainly as a function of doping, you see it disappear. Oh, it's function of doping, okay, at the same point, the superconducting. Yes, yeah, well, and the, at the end of the red region, yeah. Is this YPCO? No, no, this is uh, BISCO. BISCO. And they also have it in another, another material. Uh, YPCO, no one's on STM. It doesn't keep properly. Uh, well, sorry, so this is the definition of the red region now, where this order parameter is not vanishing, or is that? All right. Uh, <laughs> Right. No, no, the red re that particular plot was for YBCO, that, that phase diagram. Yeah. The STM measurement is not on YBCO. But uh, that similar phase diagrams are, there's evidence that the phase diagram for BISPO is very similar from X-ray scattering. But no one's drawn such a pretty phase diagram in some paper that I could show you for BISPO. Okay, no, but so, but the way you had in the picture, the superconducting region was bigger than the red region. Yes, right? yeah. So. Yeah. Here, here this order parameter goes away at the edge of the red oh, region. Yes, correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, so it's so it's not quite a superconducting order parameter. It's, it's <coughs> no, it's not. This is a complete. This is a separate order parameter. Right. No, I know. So what? So, well, are you going to tell us then what it means? Or what it means? What it means? Yes. <laughs> well, I can't do word. everything. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you just happy to see it? <laughs> 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 yeah, the cosmic, uh, cosmic Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Can I ask? <coughs> yeah, sure. Uh, the copper lattice yeah. is essential. I mean, the, first of all, uh, maybe you can explain why you think this density is only on oxygen, and I would assume that the charge is just not. By well, no, so let me go back to this picture here, this basic expression. Yeah. Uh, so you just look at this expression here. Okay. Uh, so here, R1 and R2, let's say we're working with a single band model, R1 and R2 sit on the copper sides. The coordinates are sitting on the copper <coughs> side. So if I want the on side, if I put R1 equals R2, I want the density on a copper side. And you can see from here, so this is zero. And P of zero, if you don't take this for it, put this in here, P of zero is equal to PS. Okay. So the S component will only show up on the copper. <coughs> now if I have this guy, PD, you take this Fourier trans put this in here, take the Fourier transform, this is non-zero only if Ri minus Rj equals one. So you have to be on a bond. So this has to be R1, R2 has to be R, R1 plus X, or so R1 plus X. So you get one. a central picture and yeah, so you Mickey Mouse here? This is the picture then, yeah. yeah. So, well, actually I have another picture here, which is a little more complete. Uh, I deleted that, sorry. Okay. Uh, well, let's just go back to this picture. Yeah, this picture here. So the red and the, so to evaluate the red, the red is only sensitive, uh, the red and the blue, the bond density is only sensitive to the uh, S prime and the D components. Because uh, 
R1 has to not equal R2 to get me, you know, I have to evaluate something on the bond to get the density on the oxygen. Okay. okay. So just the fact that it's D immediately tells you it's on the oxygen. It can't be on the copper. If it was S, it would be on the copper. But in at least this way of doing the symmetry analysis, which I think is the correct way to do it. Uh, so that's also saying it's D immediately tells, so saying, saying it's on the oxygen tells you the charge density wave is either S prime or D. Then noticing that the phase shift between vertical and horizontal oxygen is pi tells you it's D. Okay. Now you could also look at the oxygen sites and take their Fourier transform uh, and we have done it and you see a very weak peak uh, at, uh, at one quarter zero. So there, in fact there is a very weak charge density wave on the copper sites but it's much weaker. The dominant one by far the strongest density wave is on the oxygen sites. And <coughs> moreover, if you just add up all the oxygen sites, you'll get zero because it cancels between the horizontal and vertical bonds. But if you do a phase sensitive analysis with this, you know, you have to, to get to tease it out of this data, you had to mask half the data, you know. You had to take, this was the key step. If, this is the, if you take the Fourier transform of both, you don't see much. But if you take a subset of the data here and subset of the data there, you see very nice peaks. But you see them with a phase shift of pi. So, I mean, we saw this here. You can see this. You take off OX, you get peaks. And OY, you get peaks. You add OX plus OY, which is what you would do if you took the full Fourier transform. There's hardly anything there. So, so that's why you have to do this very carefully. Now, yes? Is uh, the charge density wave have anything to do with model fluctuation? That's the next part of my talk. That's theory. Let me just, I'm just trying to explain the experiment. <laughs> uh, so one thing I should note, uh, and I, so I pretended this because this is the clearest way to understand what's going on, uh, but there was another very beautiful experiment <laughs> uh, by the group of Andre Adam and Shelley a few months ago uh, using X-ray scattering. So this is X-ray scattering, where they send in X-rays on the copper oxygen planes. Where they send in X-rays with sigma and pi polarizations. Uh, and uh, this is another view of their sample. Uh, I guess this is K in and K out. And then they also varied the angle alpha. So they, what they plot, what they, so they, had, so you now we have this very complicated geometry. <coughs> You're polarizing a beam in different directions and you're rotating the angle sample. Okay. A and the whole purpose of doing all of this is that depending on the angle of your sample and your polarization, you scatter off the X oxygen and the Y oxygen in a different way. Your matrix elements for the two are different. So they know all the matrix elements. So the oxygen, the copper, they know the matrix element from X -ray, for X-ray scattering of oxygen and copper. They know where the oxygen and copper sits. So they took uh, our proposal for what the state is, and compare it uh, with the angular dependence of the X-ray scattering ratio of I sigma to I pi. So this is a much more, you know, involves about five pages of theoretical computation. You take the, pack, the pictures I show you, you take your X-rays and the polarization, and you, then you put in all the form factors and the cross section, and you figure out the scattering amplitude. Uh, and what they found was that, you know, if you assume that D charge density wave, uh, that's the orange, it's almost a perfect fit, and S and S prime is much worse. So they concluded with 80% uh, probability, it's, it's uh, so that was a paper a few months ago. Uh, I, I was, of course, delighted because we predicted it with D, uh, but nobody else was immediately convinced because the analysis was complicated. Uh, now we know from the STM that they got it right. I mean, I, 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 there's still some questions about the analysis by people who know X-ray scattering, I don't. Uh, but anyway, they, they looks like they knew what they're doing. <laughs> All right, so then this is the main conclusion then. Through STM and X-ray scattering, we have now, you know, I think pretty convincing evidence uh, that the order parameter here is this structure. It's just the density wave on the oxygen sides with a pi phase shift between X and Y. <laughs> and uh, you know, the very clear cut experimental evidence. Okay.
So now um, I have to finish at 4.30, right? So let me then go on to theory. So where, how, why did we propose this? So we actually, you know, we pro predicted this D wave, and why did we predict it? And why do we think it'd be there? Uh, so let me talk, give you a, uh, okay, uh, give you a, a quick summary of theoretical ideas. So the, let me go back to the two extremes of the phase diagram. Uh, here we have the antiferromagnet. There we have the metal. So we just want to combine them. So that's what we're going to do in the theory. Uh, here's the Fermi surface, and then there's some, for some, the local spin correlations want to be in this checkerboard pattern, and so we write that in terms of an, a boson order parameter phi, which uh, is slowly varying times this rapidly varying uh, k uh, factor, which has this precisely this pattern at pi pi. Okay, so now let's imagine that you started with this Fermi surface, and then this kind of broken symmetry appeared. Now, the electrons moving on the Fermi surface will then scatter off these electrons, which are forming these moments. And when they scatter, they will pick up this momentum capital K. So here's my Fermi surface. They get scattered by K. Uh, and then you notice that these special points uh, where the initial and final states have zero are both on the Fermi surface. And that's where you open up <coughs> gaps. Uh, and you get this reconstructed Fermi surface. So the consequence of magnetic order antiferromagnetic order is the appearance of this reconstructed Fermi surface. And so now you have this phase diagram of a quantum phase transition as a function of some parameter between an ordinary metal and an antiferromagnetic metal. And so in this metal, there's no magnetism. Here there's antiferromagnetism. And the Fermi surfaces have different shapes. This is not important for really anything in the end. But this is the kind of th theory we will work very hard try to understand what happens near this point where you transition one from the other. But I'll spare you that theory, but I'll just tell you one thing. When we worked very hard at it, and what we found is that before we actually got to this transition where antiferromagnetism appeared, lots of other things happened. And I'm just going to describe. And the two things in particular were the strongest things that happened, generically near such a critical point. And what are those two things? Well, they turn out to be D-wave superconductivity and D-wave bond order. Uh, and so I'll show you roughly why. So this argument for D-wave superconductivity actually goes back to even before the discovery of ITC. Uh, Scalafino et al. were looking at a Hubbard model on a cubic lattice, and they argued that it should have a D-wave superconductivity. And the argument was the following, um, that you, you take a pair of electrons uh, moving along, and then they interact with each other by the exchange coupling J. Uh, so that's the uh, wavy line here. So they have this exchange interaction, uh, which is this wavy line. And if you just look at the effect of this interaction, um, it ends up leading to an attractive interaction uh, oh, sorry, that's, uh, between <coughs> these two electrons. So what you find is that this pair of electrons, A and B, over here and here, uh, when, you, when it picks up antiferromagnetism, it gets scattered by the momentum K. So A goes to C and B goes to D and then back, back and forth. So A, B, back and forth to C, D. Uh, and then you find this pair of <coughs> particles has a bound state near the Fermi surface, provided the wave function changes sign. So in a particular, it has to be, you know, the green region is plus, and the, sorry, the red region is plus, <coughs> and the green region is minus. And, and that's why it's D-wave superconductivity. So this is a very old and well-established uh, simple argument why you get D-wave uh, superconductivity. Now, there are many details. Of course, the details of the theory are can only be trusted when J is very weak, but J is quite large. And what happened to strong coupling is a whole long story, which we still try to sort out. But it seems like this basic argument is correct. It explains why we found D-wave superconductivity. OK, so now this is my most complicated theoretical slide. Uh, telling you some, uh, this exchange interaction has a rather subtle symmetry. And that symmetry, in words, uh, is I want this, uh, this analysis for people like Paul and others who probably find the analysis simpler than my words. But let me say it in words. Uh, suppose you have two electrons 
interacting with each other. Well, they can, what kind of interactions can they have? Well, they could have a Coulomb interaction. Okay, so it's repulsive, the Coulomb interaction. Now, I take this electron and I convert it to a hole. The Coulomb interaction changes. It becomes attractive. Now, the two electrons can also have an exchange interaction, which is antiferromagnetic. We want them to be antiparallel. Now, I take this electron and convert it to a hole. The exchange interaction, it turns out, has the same strength. It's still attractive and it's still J. Exactly the same. So that's a uh, way of saying what this equation say more formally, that the exchange interaction is invariant under particle hole transformations. <coughs> but almost everything else changes when you do a particle hole transformation, but the exchange coupling doesn't. It doesn't care whether you have two particles interacting or a particle in a hole. So let me take this old argument of why two particles interacting with each other should form a D-wave pair and just take this lower particle and convert it to a hole. So in the Feynman diagrams, all I have to do is change the arrow. Uh, and when you do this, you find that the exchange coupling remains the same. The Coulomb interaction flips sign. Uh, but everything else remains almost exactly the same. And so this immediately tells you that there should be an attractive interaction between a particle and a hole in the D-wave channel. OK, so this, uh, this a and B have some finite momentum, so it's a little more subtle than that, but that's the basic argument. So what in this description was specific about it being D wave? I just didn't catch that. Um, well, it's this, let's go back to the old argument, why this is D. Okay. Uh, uh, there are some details in matrix element factors you have to work through. I mean, we put in the Pauli matrices. That is important. <laughs> and when you just work those through, you find, if you solve this beta solfeder equation of two particles, you'll find uh, it's it's attractive as long as the particle wave function, uh, two particle wave function changes sign when they when you move around the Fermi surface. So when a uh, this oh, pair okay. of when a b gets carried to c d, you have to change the sign of the wave function. Okay, I sorry I didn't absorb that. Before. Yeah, and and all I'm saying now is that that's also true in the particle hole channel. Got it. Thank you. So here's a more careful calculation that we've done, where we solve the beta solfeder equation. Here we look at the eigenvalue of the particle hole pair as a function of the center of mass momentum of the particle hole pair, which is the, which is the wave vector Q of the charge density wave. <laughs> so when you do that, uh, you know, you find some different eigenvalues as a function of Q. The global minimum eigenvalue is at this <coughs> wave vector QQ, which is actually not what's seen in the experiments. And there we have a D wave, um, yeah, essentially 100% D wave. But there is, at what's seen in the experiment is this wave vector. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a secondary minimum. It's not the global minimum. But, uh, so maybe, you know, this is a very simple calculation. Maybe a more complex calculation would be make that the global minimum. And I'll show one in a minute. But what this calculation showed already was that if I look at the eigenfunction of the particle whole pair, you know, it's like this is the D and there's an S. So there's a, you know, 10, 20% error, <coughs> uh, but mostly D. It's still D for the same reason. So this was, you know, our first observation that in, at the experimental of observed wave vector, the density wave should be D. And as you can see now, that this is just coming from a very simple argument that the most important microscopic interaction is the anti-fermented exchange coupling. When it acts between two particles, it gives you a D wave superconductivity. When it acts between a particle and a hole, it gives you this D form factor charge density. It's really as simple as that. So, is it, what's this computation in? Which model is this? This is just a Hartree Fox calculation in the TJ model or TJV model. Okay, so we've done, a, and this wave vector Q is that, and that's also experimentally about the right one. Uh, let me just skip that. So Andrea Ale in particular, this is a more sophisticated calculation using variational Monte Carlo with Kutsula projection and so on. Uh, again, with uh, strong on-site repulsion. And here, there's a regime of parameters where we do indeed find that the Q0 wave vector uh, you know, is the lowest energy in this whole purple region. And if you look at uh, at that point, what's the value of Q that's preferred is, again, it's actually pretty much the experimentally observed factor. So we can get lots of other states, but there's certainly a regime where we get exactly what's seen in the experiments. And is Q not, value Q not also depends on token concentration? Yes, yes, and it, 
depression is basically given by this this distance. And experimentally, that's also correct. It's pretty accurately given by this distance. Okay, so yeah, so the, actually here it is. I was looking for this plot. Uh, so this here's a plot. So this is the basic order parameter. Now I even put 0.3 of the s. So this is the s, the 0.3. And now if you look at the copper side, there's a weak density wave on the <coughs> copper sides. Okay, but the but you know much stronger density wave on the oxygen sides, uh, which has a phase shift of pi between the horizontal and vertical. And it's really important that it be written exactly this way with this factor over here, exactly this form. There were some earlier discussions of a higher angle momentum density waves by Chetan Nayak and Laughlin and Chakravarti and others. They did a very different decomposition uh, in a way that at incommensurate wave vectors really confuses the issue of particle holes of time reversal symmetry. This is really the way you should do it, and, and how our whole analysis is predicated on this this what I believe is the correct way to write it. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm giving this talk in front of Bob Laughlin next week, and I'm going to make the same statements, believe me. <laughs> You're going to shoot me. <laughs> well, he, 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 so he, he, in this uh, picture, um, will uh, the holes? Where are the holes? Yeah, I mean, the hole is a physical hole. Well, this is the density of charge, so that is how the, the whole, I mean, so from the X-ray scattering, we know that the modulation of the charge, this delta rho equals plus one, uh, that's around in physical units, around 0.05 to 0.075 okay, of charge E, okay? So the charge density wave on the oxygen is not a weak one. <laughs> Relative to the dopant density, which is 0.1, it's almost 50%. But it's quite a large charge density wave relative to the whole density on the oxygen sites. Uh, but its most important feature it has a phase shift of pi, which makes it, in a naive experiment, harder to see. But once you know what you're looking for, it's really easy to see, as I showed you. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm about <coughs> five minutes, right? Is that correct? So yeah. All right. A little more. Okay. I mean, I can keep going. So, uh, but that's the so then so this is hopefully one and two. Everyone was with me, and then this was some rapid discussion of theory. So now let me talk about some other experiments. And there's many, many other experiments, and we continue to do work here. Uh, I think this picture fits together with essentially all experiments. But okay, uh, with the, well, it has the potential. Say, we, we, there's nothing as dramatic as what I've shown you but I think it has the potential to very naturally explain just about everything else, with the one exception of these Philip Bourge experiment on magnetic moments. Uh, but that's not corroborated by any other class of experiments. Uh, okay. So another famous set of experiments in the red region were the quantum oscillations. Uh, so this is kind of, of course, an ahistorical order. Uh, but I did mention this earlier. This was really important in people focusing on the importance of the charge density wave order in this red region. So this uh, was first observed by uh, Louis Taifer and his group in YBCO, where at fields of 60 tesla and higher, uh, they saw that the resistance started oscillating uh, as a function of magnetic field. This is actually increasing field this way. Uh, and when you plot it as 1 over b, you see that it's perfectly periodic. Uh, and from this period, you can read off the size of the Fermi surface. So that's a, there's a basic result in solid state physics uh, that when you have a metal, uh, that all of its physical properties will oscillate as a function of the strength of the magnetic field. And from the period of the oscillation, you know the size of the Fermi surface. So uh, I won't, I assume you've heard that before, but that's a very natural consequence. Roughly speaking, what's happening uh, is that the electrons on the Fermi surface are moving in a circle as you apply a magnetic field in momentum space, if you wish. And, and and when the phase they pick up as they go around the circle is 2 pi, there's a things oscillate. So if it's 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, you get oscillation in the density of states. So just a simple quantum interference effect uh, from the Arunabha motion of the electrons in the magnetic field. You can also view it as a precursor to Landau levels, but here the fields are much too small to see any quantum Hall effects because the density, I mean, these are the, these are the strongest fields on Earth. <laughs> ever achieved, you know, 60 tesla and above, 
but the reason, but it's still very weak because the electron density is so high in these materials compared to the gallium arsenide semiconductors. Um, uh, here is a more recent measurement, uh, you know, just beautiful data up to 100 tesla as a function of angle and uh, so on by Sukitra, uh, Sebastian and collaborators. Uh, and many of these details really convincingly tells a lot about what's going on, but let me not skip ahead. So what is the model? What is the reason you see these oscillations? So when the oscillations first appeared, immediately there were two classes of theorists. The one class of theorists who said, oh, this is irrelevant, forget about this. And the other class said, here's my model. And there were literally <laughs> hundreds of models. Uh, but it turns out, looking back, in fact, an experimentalist, uh, two experimentalists, Harrison and Sebastian, got the right model, in my oh. opinion. <laughs> and this was their model. <laughs> my model was wrong. I had a model. It's just wrong. But, you know, I, love th I like this model even better, as you'll see in a minute. So here's, here's what's going on. Uh, if you Here's the Fermi surface. And you apply a magnetic field. And as I said earlier, the electrons, you know, move along the Fermi surface. Now this, they come out here, and then go back come out there, go back, and, and, and then come out here and go. So you get this big orbit, really it's not. <coughs> so that size of that orbit uh, will tell you what the period should be. So if you measure that, you know you know where these Fermi surfaces are from photo emission. You measure that, you get the period, it's completely off. So you need something else. And what that something else, everybody had an opinion on what that something else was. But here, what Sebastian and Harrison said, Let's assume that something else is a charge density wave at this wave vector Q that I just showed you. So that would be this wave vector QX here and QY here. So now what happens? Now when the electron is moving along here, it can jump by Q because you have this modulation. It can always pick up Q whenever it wants. Okay. So this electron moves here, jumps by Q, moves here, jumps by Q, moves here, jumps by Q, and so on. So it gets a much smaller orbit. And if you just move these lines over, you get this red orbit. That's a much smaller orbit, and it has an electron-like Hall signature, which is another feature of the, of the measurements. And it also has the right area. So, uh, so, and as I'm going to show you in a minute, it's consistent with many other observations. So, this density wave order that STM has been seeing for so many years, X-ray is now seeing, uh, really seems to be consistent with the quantum oscillations too. Uh, so, we have done a more careful calculation. Uh, so, this is. We put in this density wave order and actually computed the photo emission spectrum. Uh, I guess Paul is gone, but this is for him. <laughs> uh, you know, you see these arc-like features, and even very faint, you see this or this pocket I just showed you. You barely see it. So one of the questions always was, well, if there's this pocket, why does the photo emission see it? It's just the intensity is very weak. On the other hand, we took the same same model, this which gives you the spectrum. <coughs> Uh, and this electron pocket, and actually compute it. This is what Andrea L.A. did. Uh, the oscillation, the density of states. This is a, so you put a magnetic field physically and just figure out how does the density of it oscillate. Uh, this is what we get. Uh, and you take the Fourier transform of that, there's the peak. And in fact, the area this corresponds to is precisely this thing here, which you can barely see in photo emission. So that's all, I mean, we. We did, so this is a full calculation on a semi-classical argument of splitting orbits. This is a complete calculation of free electrons on lattice in a magnetic field, and, and you see exactly the right period with this charge density wave. Uh, and this is more at finite temperature, then all of this other stuff disappears, and you see these arc-like feature again, something that football uh, has been working on. Uh, let me just keep ahead. All right, so, oh. so finally, in the last couple of minutes, in the next month's issue of Science, there's a couple of STM papers looking at what's happening here, looking at the Fermi surface. Uh, and what they both see, this is uh, my colleague Jenny Hoffman's paper, uh, where, okay, this, this is the same kind of STM Fourier transform, the STM data, now at somewhat different energies, uh, and there's a lot of analysis that goes into translating this picture into this picture. And I won't go through that. But what they conclude from pictures like this, that in this region, the Fermi surface is these arcs, just as I showed you. And at high doping, when there's no charge density wave, 
uh, you get these new features here telling you that it becomes a full flowing surface. So there seems to be very clear evidence uh, of some kind of at least a phase transition uh, in the structure of the Fermi surface right there. Uh, and this is the Seamus Davis group, also in a companion article in the same <coughs> issue of Science, I think in a couple of weeks, seeing the same thing from going from arc-like features to full <coughs> Okay, so I'm just, <laughs> that's the end. Uh, so I have talked about the origins of D-wave superconductivity, just reviewed that and showed you that there's a very simple and natural partner of it, which seems to be present. Certainly, is, I think it is present unquestionably in, in certain cuprates. Uh, and in the last part, I argued it also helps explain many other mysteries, but that's, of course, a little bit more speculative. Uh, so, so the answer then again to this question mark uh, is, oops, okay, <laughs> is what's here is this thing, uh, and this was just hiding in this map of a superconductor. I just didn't see it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The transition between the red region and the superconducting region. Yeah. Is this the exchange interaction no longer dominating, so that argument doesn't quite work, or is it something else? Yeah, yeah, something? it's it's not as strong, and then so there's a quantum phase transition where the charge density wave disappears. Yeah. Then, you know, what's really changing is the Fermi surface, not so much J, but effectively it becomes a weakly interacting system. So I understood you were saying that all this D-wave stuff comes because you're approaching the spin order. And, and that, okay, so that, that was in part three. So you may or may not buy that. I'm you know, I think you should buy these pictures because that's independent of any theory. But then the, how did we, we predict this would happen was from that sort of argument, yes. And so what I didn't see how it fit into the picture is there's that the superconducting region to the left of the red region. So oh, here. Well, the superconductivity is present here, too. It's not as if it disappeared. It's well, I understand, but why does the D-wave go away before you get to the spin? Uh, yeah, well, there you have to start treating the spin order a little more carefully, I guess. And, uh, yeah, uh, I don't think we understand that. We don't understand this region very well. <laughs> sure. Uh, the Harrison-Sebastian uh, argument, I mean, uh, uh, I that Fermi surface is very generic. There's nothing special about that. So one has to wonder <coughs> why something like that happen in tin or copper or you know in, in other. Well, you need a charge density wave. But there are many other materials. Yeah, sure. So in all of the materials, that argument, you know, the computation of the Fermi surface with the charge density is not new. Right. What was so the point? Is the, the 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 idea was that the charge density wave was important. You know, I, the way I presented it, it sounds so obvious, but at that time, in 2007, I don't think that you, if you polled people and asked, what's the probability that charge entry wave might be CO when they're seeing quantum oscillation, almost everybody would say, no, it's not there, I, including me. <laughs> so it was not obvious at that time. But then still the reverse question, why don't you see it in other materials? Which other material? Anything? You of course see it. There's no question. I mean, it's very simple. Once you, if you know the charge density wave, it's very easy to figure out what the quantum oscillation is going to look like, and uh, absolutely it works. Uh, you can you already see it photo emission. You see Fermi surface reconstructing. You see it in the Nick tires. You see change of the period and kind of magnetic order. Absolutely, you see. It. I'm, I'm sure. You no, no, what was the mystery there was identifying the right order parameter responsible for the Fermi surface reconstruction. And the fact that the electron packets sit on the nodes, not the antinodes. Everyone thought they were sitting on the antinodes. It had to do with magnetism or other order parameters. Uh, it, it was uh, okay. I, I have presented it in a way where it all seems obvious, but and it and it is once you look at it in this way, I claim. But it was not at all obvious at that time. <laughs> um. That charge density wave can be viewed as a two-dimensional crystal, right? It's, it's two-dimensional crystal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's so would, it, would it melt? Um, sure. If you go up in temperature. Yeah, it does melt. I mean, so there, I, there is a lot. We have a lot of work on the temperature, but I just did talk about it. Okay. okay. It becomes fluctuating. And so it would have elementary excitations of two-dimensional crystal and so on. So dislocations oh, that's and. Uh, yeah, it would. I don't think there's any study of that. Yeah, that would be a very interesting thing to think about. <coughs> I mean, the, the correlation then at zero field is relatively small. I mean, those peaks were not that sharp. There's a lot of impurities already. 
or, or let's put it this way, any impurity, any oxygen vacancy is like a random field. So strictly speaking, uh, there is never any long range order in two dimensions. Uh, you need, you know, you need a three-dimensional yeah, but, but 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 the crystal which is spin to the original lattice, right? Yeah. So, but, but there are random field perturbations. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. So it's, but in high magnetic field, uh, it's hard to do these experiments at high magnetic field. But in high magnetic field, where we think the long the coherence length of the charge density may become very large, then at that point, I think it would be very interesting to think about these dislocations and so on. But there are no very few experiments there high fields, uh, it's only transport. <laughs> well, can I, a pork can have a mask. <laughs> you avoided the word stripes, right? So to say anything about stripes? Well, I did say about lantern embasement. Well, I know, I, it's right there. I mean, <coughs> well, I would say, I, no, I mean, this is a stripe. <coughs> this is a stripe. If you want to call it a stripe, please go ahead. But right, I mean, it's just the same mechanism, you think, for... Well, as I said... Uh, so been called stripes before. Well. If you take the pictures of what people draw in stripes with this anti-phase domain model, if you take the pictures that were drawn, uh, they have no D wave component, have zero D wave component, and they have magnetism. They're all on the, they draw the thing on the copper side and they draw the spins going this way. Uh, so what were those pictures drawn from? You know, there was some very different physical motivation. Right. Now what I think needs to be done is to go back and do these more careful experiments on those lanthanum based stripes where you have magnetism. And uh, I think it will be some mixture of the old pictures and the new pictures. I think they're kind of smoothly connected. But this is really a, here the physical motivation and the way this comes about has very little to do with, uh, with the insulator or the model. The mod insulator, I didn't mention the word mod insulator until now. And that's the difference between stripes and what I'm talking about. <laughs> In, in the picture, it's a uh, magnetic uh, incrementary field. Right, that's the other huge, that's right. So the, so the, the, so the, the, the wave vector is determined by 2Q of the spin and so on and so forth. Here it oh, seems to be related to the Fermi surface, okay. which is what again first came out of STM by Eric Hudson and others first started saying that this is actually connected to the Fermi surface, and which I, uh, I was very much. So I think there's some continuum between this physical picture, it depends what you mean by stripes. By stripe, you mean a, a density wave with one wave vector? Yeah, then it's a stripe. But there's a lot more to it than that. Well, that's not what they. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's thank our.